like us that were breathing with plans and hope for the future have been killed once again. Salvan Kaduna. People are, are being killed like animals. And yet we are ongoing. We go we are going about with our businesses. The government doesn't care. The state government is nowhere to be found. The federal government is nowhere to be found. Even if we say that, okay, yes, security is in the hands of the federal government. The president is the one that is the commander-in-chief. And the way Nigeria is set up, the apparatus of uh, security is in the hands of the president. But at least let the state government show empathy. Let them show a human face. Let the state government... If it was another place now, before or before Erufai became governor, choo 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 choo, he's smart, he knew everything, he knew what to say. For the first time since December of 2021, food and other supplies have arrived in Tigray a war-torn region of Ethiopia. The UN's World Food Program said that more truckloads of food and fuel could arrive today. This has become possible following a humanitarian truce between the Ethiopian government and the Tigrayan forces. Over 5 million people need help to survive the 17-month-old war that has dis displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Nigerian engineers yesterday repaired the damaged section of the Kaduna Abuja rail track, destroyed when bandits attacked a train carrying over 900 passengers. Last week's attack that killed eight people and injured many more also led to the kidnapping of a few dozens. The same week, bandits attacked the regional airport in Kaduna and intensified the attacks on the Kaduna Abuja road. The complete grounding of the busy Kaduna Abuja transport routes has highlighted the seriousness of the insecurity in the Northwest. It is 11.30 a.m. in New York. It is 8.30 a.m. in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. It is 6.30 p.m. in Nairobi, Kenya. It is 4.30 p.m. in Nigeria. Wherever in the world you're joining us, welcome to another edition of 90 Minutes Africa. On our show today, we have gender and rights activist Aisha Yusufu joining us from Abuja. She will discuss the issue of women in politics in Nigeria, the hijab controversy in schools, and eight years after the Bring Back Our Girls uh, movement. Aisha, you. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. And uh, Ramadan Karim. Thank you so much, Ramadan Karim, to you too. Okay, uh, the light is not very clear where you are. Yeah, it, it, it is not, yeah, so just give me a moment. Okay. I think let me change my position. Yeah. That might be better. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, Chido, well, this is an interesting day. We have Aisha joining us, and uh, we are going to tackle all the issues uh, taking place in the, the country. Um, she's well known for her views, and uh, we are looking forward to having her on the show today. Uh, exactly. We're excited to have her. Uh, she's been in the news uh, for many, many years now. Uh, some people would like to describe her as controversial, but uh, she's uh, one woman who uh, knows uh, how to express herself and uh, her voice resonates with a lot of people. And we hope that uh, in the next uh, 90 minutes, we would hear from her on right. a wide range of issues she's back yeah she's back all right yeah i hope this is much clearer right uh not uh, not by much but but we can oh yeah uh, i know you can it can be better just just try to position it the differently just uh opposite where you are now just um yeah sorry guys um we we um there are so many issues uh, that that are in the news that we want to address. One of them is uh, I just I just got someone responding to our our call for questions about the imam that um, that was suspended for.
for criticizing uh, Buhari, uh, uh, Buhari in uh, yesterday, I think, or Friday. So, which is which is quite interesting. Is this okay, all right. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, Chido. How do you say? Yeah, you but the video is not on. Can we? Uh, oh. I'm not seeing. Oh, okay. Can can you pull her up? Oh, okay. can, can you can you turn on your camera? I will do that now. It's four of people. Yeah. Is this um am I on? Yes, yeah, you yeah, are on. on but turn, but turn on your camera. We can't see. Oh my camera is come from here. Oh. Except if there's another camera. Can, can you see us? Yeah, I can see you guys. Okay. okay, right now my camera is off. Okay, okay. It's off now. Uh, it's on now. Okay. If you can't see me, I can go back and come back again. Um, I can leave and return, maybe. Yeah, yes, L let's try it because it doesn't seem like uh, it's you that we're looking at. It looks like a picture. Uh, I don't see you uh, okay. moving around at all, yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, viewers. We are going to um, get it right. Um, we kind of uh, we're running late, and we didn't try some of these things. In the meantime, while we do that, let's. Why don't we um, play an interesting video of um, one of the things that happened yesterday, which was Yaya Bello announcing that he's finally going to run for president. And he wasn't kidding all the while. You know, we thought that he was kidding. But um okay, good, good. Yeah, now we have Aisha. Now you're talking. Oh yeah. No, Nigeria is bad, but not that bad. You know, we can do better. <laughs> and they say there are no bad weather, only bad clothing. So <laughs> even if it doesn't work, we keep trying. Okay, yeah. right. Exactly. Very good, very good. It's nice to have you, Aisha. Um thank you, know. you so much. Great, for to having have, me. great to have you. Yeah. Thank okay. you for having me. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay, so where do we start? There are a lot of uh, issues. You, why don't you play that video about the mom uh, from Friday? Then maybe we'll get Aisha's take on this. Okay. She's one person who has been quite critical about her attitude or disposition uh, about religion in Nigeria. OK. Um, oh, sorry. Um, Aisha, we are referring to, I'll play the video in a moment. We are referring to the Imam, uh, Abuja Imam, that was suspended because he criticized the mm -hmm. president. Are you aware of that? Yeah, I'm aware of the video. I've watched, uh, I've seen the video. I've also listened to the interview by the head of committee uh, that, that, that suspended him, uh, that Senator Saeedu and Sado. And I've also, I did a reaction video on that, although that was in Hausa. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, okay so yeah. I can hear the person being played back. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I've, I've listened to that uh, uh, video. And one of the things that uh, uh, Senator Saeed Ansada said that uh, uh, they've spoken to him severally to stop what he's doing, criticizing the government and all of that. And when the journalist asked him what was really wrong in what he had said, and, uh, Senator Saeed Ansada, with whom I believe is said to come from Zamfara State, that's one of the states that's really affected by uh, by terrorists, will say that the, the, the imam is supposed to tell the people that what the situation we have in Nigeria today is beyond uh, human, uh, is beyond human capacity and that people should just rely on God. That was what he said. And I'm wondering whether this same Senator Saeed Ansado did not know of God during uh, 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 former President Goodluck Ebele, Jonathan. I mean, it's just hypocrisy that, that is just play, playing out here. And one of the things that it's, it's been done now is to shut the voices of the few uh, imams that we have that are actually are saying the facts the way the way they are. Now they're playing all all, all of the uh, tribal and religious uh, cards that they, they can play. All of a sudden, we are being told that we shouldn't address government, we shouldn't hold government accountable, we should go back and pray to God. God will not do for us what he has given us the capacity for us to do for ourselves. An issue of uh, governance, like I said a few days ago, this is not a test. The, the terrorist attacks we are facing in Nigeria is not a test from God. The way some of these malams are making it 
out to be. It is lack of good governance in, in our country. It is the failure of governance that has led to this. But of course, you know what they say about Nigerians. The, our mumu button is always religion. The moment they play religion, people are ready to do nothing. And if we continue to do nothing, we are all citizens waiting to happen. Being a victim in Nigeria, like I've always said, it's no longer a matter of if, it's a matter of when, sadly. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. Just a quick follow-up again on uh, the issue of religion. In the book, Remaking Nigeria, you wrote a chapter, and one of the issues that came up there, and I'm just paraphrasing you here, you say, we pray for the things God has given us capacity to do for ourselves, and yet we kill and maim in the name of God. We fight for God and leave our fights to God. How do you think we can get out of this uh, terrible situation as a people? Uh, the way we can, yeah, go ahead. No, essentially, we, uh, I just want to see in your own uh, thoughts or views, how do you think what needs to be done? Uh, what needs to be done is to ensure that people are educated. And the more educated people are, the, the less you'll be able to uh, to use uh, either religion or anything blankly over them because they will question. And one of the funny things, and you know, sadly, is the fact that Islam is very strong on on, on religion. It's very strong on 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 uh, on the knowledge that people acquire, and that's why the first verse that that, that was uh, 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 sent down to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was Ikra. It said, "Read, read in the name of your Lord." And it didn't say just wait. And Islam is always about religion. That's why in Islam there's nothing like divine uh, divinity. Nobody has any divinity. There's nothing defined about anybody. What even the imams and the sheikh, the level that you have is dependent on the education that you are quite sort of like a professorial kind of thing. It's not as if there's something divine or you have some torch or something like that. So in a religion like that, people having that knowledge and uh, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in one of these uh, the hadiths of the prophet they said he said to people we should seek for knowledge even if it takes us to to china so Every knowledge is very important. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also said that we should seek for knowledge from uh, from cradle to grave. And today you find a situation whereby people are not educated. They are not educated about Islam. They are not. Uh, they don't have Western education. They don't have any form of education. People are just left on the street. Even the ones that go for al majiri the normal that is supposed to be, oh, they go to seek for knowledge. They go to. They are taken to those Muslims places. They are abandoned. They fend for themselves. They are on the street. And at the end of the day, they do not acquire any form of uh, no, knowledge at all. So when people are not educated. You have people that will come and use religion for them because they know that no questioning, there's no place where they will be where, where they will be will, they will be questioned. In, in, in uh, one of the hadiths of the prophet, there's a wife of the prophet, uh, Umu Salama. She had gone to the prophet one time, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and said to him, Why is it that only women, or oh, sorry, only men are being mentioned in the Quran. Where is the place of women? Why are women being uh, not being uh, mentioned in the Quran? And then a verse will come where they talked about the believing woman and the believing man and, and, and so on and so forth. During the time of the Prophet, there is, uh, there is uh, a, a, a verse Abasa where the where the prophet had as uh, a blind person had come to him as where he was trying to get some of the you know more influential people influ uh, uh, to talk to them to come into Islam and then he was a bit uh, dismissive of the blind person and and a verse was brought down and this is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam where God was sort of like saying to him, you turn away you and you frown which was the, the name of that but Abasa you he frowned that somebody came to you, you know, which is to say, this is not when anybody, there's no place in Islam where you say, oh, you cannot question what is going on. But we have a situation now today where some people are just saying to, to, to citizens, just be blind, don't do anything, don't question anybody, don't hold anybody accountable, which is not the way, which is not the way of Islam, which is not the way of the religion. And so more people acquiring that knowledge, even in terms of, I'll, I'll give another final example. Uh, the, during the time of um, as Sayyidina Umar, one of the the second caliph uh, of, of Islam after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had died. 
and during his leadership, he will go around to find out if anybody had a problem. One day he went to a woman's house and she was so angry, she didn't even know he was the one, she was criticizing him, how can she was hungry, she hadn't eaten and everything. He came and went to where they have the, the like the store of, of, of the state and took some bread that he was going to give to her. One of his, uh, one of uh, uh, he, the companions then said to him, oh, let me help you carry this. And he said, no, if you carry this on the day of, uh, of judgment, will you help me to carry my problems and yet in nigeria mothers are coming out because they are being paid they are they get a lot from the government the politicians are working in hand with the with the religious rulers to suppress the people they are saying that protest is haram they are saying that we should not hold our leaders accountable that we, we should go and uh, continue to pray so i will say to you the easiest way to do that is by educated the more people are educated they will be able to know the religion they'll be able to know their rights under under the state they'll be able to know the constitution they'll be able to know that they indeed they are citizens and they are that and they are not slaves now, Aisha, I know you've been in this struggle for a long time. And um, if you look back from, even from Bring Back and uh, Our Girls to this point, do you think that you are an activist like you, that you are making progress in educating people? Or do you think that things are getting worse than they were before? Uh, so, so first of all, I don't even see myself an, as an activist. I see myself as an active Nigerian citizen, just an active citizen. Uh, one who decided that on my 40th birthday, which was on the 12th of December 2013, I realized that I was a problem of Nigeria. I was also a problem of Nigeria by my silence. Uh, as a young girl, I hated this country because things were wrong, things weren't done the right way, and the, the corruption, the injustice, the bad governance, and I always blame the adults. And on my 40th birthday, I realized that I had become that adult that wasn't doing anything, and there are so many other teenagers who are in the same position that I used to be in uh, right now. So first of all, I see myself as an active Nigerian citizen. And I always say that Nigeria does not need more activists. Nigeria needs more active citizens. People need to sit up and understand that there are two sides of governance, right? The demand side and the supply side. Those who are voted into office are supposed to supply. We that voted them into office are supposed to make demands. And by not making demands, they will continue to, to, to go away. So on the uh, four months after my 40th birthday was when Chiburgers were abducted and I was on the street on the 30th of April 20, uh, 2014 uh, making the match for, for, for them. And later this month, it will be, that will be exactly uh, eight years. I would say that Nigerians are more active now than they used to be. Nigerians are more aware of their rights. And especially after the NSAS protests, a lot of the uh, youth, the, uh, the youth of this nation, that ordinarily are not focused on what is happening in Nigeria, they would rather be doing their other things. They didn't realize the relationship between governance and their life. They are more focused now. They are more active. They are more into what is happening. They are, they are making the, uh, their, their demands uh, more. Yes, there are a lot of uh, uh, bad governance has increased in Nigeria, no doubt about it. Uh, the insecurity has increased in Nigeria, no doubt about it. Inflation, a lot of bad things are happening in Nigeria, no doubt about it. But more and more people are getting their voices and they are speaking out. Even though the government has been so heinous, the Nigerian government behaves, in, it, it's, in short, it's a terrorist government. It attacks and kills and maims its own people. That is why when terrorists actually do kill and maim it, uh, a Nigerian citizen, the Nigerian government it doesn't seem to be affected because if the, if the, the terrorists are doing the same thing that the Nigerian uh, government uh, uh, does to its own citizens. Look at uh, uh, October 20th, 2020, where citizens were killed. They were singing the national anthem. They had the Nigerian flag. Uh, and then they were killed by soldiers who are supposed to protect the territorial integrity of our nation. They were brought in by the government and they were killed. So when terrorists actually do kill us, the Nigerian government, uh, it doesn't show any, any, any concern. So all of those have increased. But at the same time, the people who are making the mass, people are now more aware of their of their rights. People are coming out and making the mass, even though the Nigerian government have been behaving like a terrorist and clamping down and killing people, are uh, coming out when people come out for protests, people are being killed, people are being shot at, people are being made, all sorts of things are uh, done to people. And even what has been done to the imam right now is this, the usual Nigerian government's way of ensuring that voices are shut down and voices are, are pulled up. But I will say to you, more and more people are, are understanding their rights and they are making demands and that will continue to happen. But what we need beyond making demands is to be able to use it in terms of politics.
in terms of election. People understanding that protest is not just to be on the streets, there are also political protests, and our votes are our weapons. The government have security agencies to use against us. The terrorists have uh, guns to use against us. We, the citizens, we have our votes, and we, ha we are not fully using that vote to protect ourselves and also punish those who are not doing the right thing in government today. So, well, thank, thank you very much. We'll come back to the politics of it all. You briefly mentioned uh, bring back our girls. Later this month, it will be eight years after that global movement. Can you bring us up to speed what has happened? Perhaps a little history of how it all started, whether in your own view it was uh, successful and what's going on after eight years. Uh, on the 14th of uh, uh, April 2014, uh, Nigerians uh, sadly uh, were awakened by, uh, by bomb blasts at Nyanya Motor Park. Although uh, the abduction of the chief August sort of like overshadowed that, most times we forget, many Nigerians were killed. And uh, the president will visit, the then president, good luck, Billy Jonathan, will visit that site on that day. And then uh, subsequently after, would go, I think it was the following day, would go to Kano where he had a rally and they, they, they had the, the, their dance. And later that day, uh, that same 14th in the night, uh, the, the, the school was attacked in, in, in Borno State, which is the northeastern part of Nigeria. And that school is in a town called Chibok. And the school was attacked and girls were taken away. Uh, the terrorists came in. Uh, initially, it seems they came, they came to, 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 to pack their food. They would keep, from what we hear from the girls that had escaped uh, from the terrorists, and later some of them that were rescued, was the fact that they sat, they, they told them that they were soldiers. They were actually wearing military wears. They told them they were soldiers that had come to protect them, that the terrorists were around. And so the girls believed them and they got they, they made them to gather in one place. It was when they started burning the buildings that the girls realized that these were no soldiers. But then it was too late because they were encircled at, at, that, at that moment. And then they started asking whether to kill all the girls, whether to let them go, or to 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 to, to, to take them along with them. At the end of the day, those who wanted them to be taken along were the ones who won the argument, and they packed those girls in the trucks that they had that had uh, uh, come with. Uh, so they took the girls uh, 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 the, the girls uh, away. Why why they were taking them away? Some of them escaped. Two hundred fifty two hundred seventy six girls were actually abducted. 57 of them escaped immediately, and then you had 219 of them that were in, uh, in, in captivity. Some of the girls jumped out, out by holding onto trees as they were passing because they were open trucks that were used. Some of them jumped out of the, the trucks, although the terrorists had uh, machines. They were on motorcycles and they were circling and, and looking for them. So for over two years, 219 girls were in captivity. We, at the Bring Back Our Girls movement, uh, 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 the, the campaign started online. The, the hashtag bring back our girls. Uh, a, a particular lawyer was watching a live program where Dr. Obi had said, bring back our daughters. And she was talking about the, the, the kidnappings that had happened. And so he modified that. He said, oh, Dr. Obi had said, bring back our daughters. And then he made bring back our girls because uh, to, according to this lawyer, he felt that not everybody uh, would be able to, to empathize with daughters not everyone had daughters but everybody would be able to empathize with having a girl and so that was how uh the the the, the hashtag as uh, started or on online uh on the 30th of april 2014 the bring back there was the first protest happened the first uh street protest for the bring back our girls movement uh in in abuja and 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 that was it took 19 days for the then president to actually say anything about the the Chibor girls are uh, abduction. And, and, and so for two years, 219 of them were in captivity. In May 2016, the first girl was found, Amina Ali in Keki. And uh, from there on, we've had uh, over uh, 100 girls have, have, been, have, been, have been rescued. And the demands for them uh, is still on. There are still over a hundred girls that are also still uh, still still in captivity. Uh, we we have said several at the Bring Back Our Girls movement that the rescue of the Chibo girls uh, is not a privilege. It's, it's their right as enshrined in the, uh, the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, and that. Uh, 
as long as uh, Chibo girls are in captivity, we'll continue to make demands for them. This is what we've continued to do. Although, unfortunately, the Nigerian government has always seen the Bring Back Our Girls movement as the enemy. Instead of going after the terrorists to bring back our, 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 our Chibo girls, they focus on attacking the movement, maligning the leaders of the movement. We were physically attacked in May uh, 2014. Our talks were brought in, just the way talks were brought in during NSAS, they were actually brought in during the Bring Back Our Girls movement. Uh, in front of the police, the police supervised uh, the beatings that we received. They told the talks to collect the cameras from the from the journalists and also take take away all our phones so that there will not be any recording uh, recordings of that. And so we were attacked. Uh, we we faced a lot of persecution. Uh, the then uh, uh, President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan called us psychological terrorists. The DSS said we were a franchise, we were terrorists, and all sorts all sorts of things were were said against us. But the saddest part of it all is the reaction from the Nigerian people. The Nigerian people, even though yeah, the government had said that no abduction happened, and that was what the, the wife of the first uh, lady, uh, sorry, the wife of the president then, uh, good uh, patients, uh, Jonathan, who was one of those who first alluded to the fact that there was no abduction that had happened. And when she had a meeting with the women from Borno State, she, that was where she did that, her, her famous cry, uh, will you keep quiet, there is God, where she was saying that, oh, that if indeed there was an abduction and then the president is saying, come, let me help you find your daughter, will people stay away? And so that was where that there is God, oh, uh, there is God, oh, uh, a phrase uh, uh, came, came, came out from. But the thing is that the Nigerian uh, citizens, also refused to believe that there were abduction. A lot of people question. There are people even up to today, eight years after, we say that no abduction indeed uh, happened. And so there was lack of empathy. What the people didn't understand was that that Chibogas abduction was like a test from the terrorists. They wanted to know how far, how far we would go for each other. And we showed them that we wouldn't go any far for each for, for each other. And so when they were taken away, a lot of people felt it wasn't any of their business. They left the Chibogas there. And the terrorists were emboldened to come out and keep uh, attacking more people, packing away more people. And that's what we are seeing up to today. And unfortunately, also, the Nigerian government was given enabling a environment to abdicate their responsibilities. And here we are today, eight years later, the Nigerian life absolutely means nothing to its, its government. My daughter said something on the 1,000th day of Chibo girls' abduction that as long as Chibo girls are in captivity, we all are in captivity. And I think it's 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 is the reality that we have to do. All right. Thank you so much for that um, that big um, description of what, what where things are. Let me let me ask you, uh, NSAS, you were also very active there. Uh, your image actually is used, uh, image of you wearing the uh, hijab as an iconic symbol of that movement. Uh, now, the question is, uh, people see it as Nigerian people coming out to say that certain things are not acceptable anymore. But he felt, and okay, in some ways, you can say that it's succeeded in, in some ways and failed in some ways. I, I want to get you a take in terms of uh, Lekki Tollgate. I think it's reopened this week, I think. Um, what is your assessment? And do you think that there will be a next one or that Nigerians have tried and they've basically seen that it's difficult to change the system? What is your, your reading of things? Uh, first of all, when Nigerians are saying that it's difficult to change the system, I always say, what have we done? We haven't really done. What we've done, is, it's, it's just like when Thomas Edison was trying to get that uh, electric bulb and he kept failing and he kept saying that, oh, whatever way he failed was, he, he realized that that was the way not to do it. So whatever we have done all this while, it's also the, not the way to do it, to get to what we are looking for. So we cannot even afford to begin to say that, oh, we've tried or we failed, because we have to focus on where we need to, to, to be at. And so for me, I think that's, that's, that's first of all, what I would say uh, to, uh, to anyone. Over the years, we've had a series of protests that have come out. We saw the Occupy, uh, Occupy Nigeria. We saw the Bring Back Our Girls Movement. We saw the NSAS protests and on and on. People we keep learning from it. Uh, more people we we come out and do and do certain things over time, and so we'll, we'll be expectant of all of these things uh, 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 coming on. The answers protest, unlike the Bring Back Our Girls protest, was a protest of survival. The Bring Back Our Girls protest was a protest of em empathy, and it's Florence also that made us to understand, you know, this this uh, two distinction. In the case of the uh, the answers protest. 
it was the victims themselves. Most most of the people who came out for that protest were victims. Some of them were victims many times over. Some of them were victims in different states, or they had loved ones who were victims or uh, relatives who were, who were victims. And so for them, it was personal. This were Nigerian youth who the, 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 the nation hasn't given them an enabling environment, and they, yet they were striving to survive. They were doing a lot of things for themselves, and still, the nation kept coming after them. Police that were supposed to protect them were maiming them, were extorting money from them, were killing them. And when they came out to cry out and said, and simply said to the Nigerian government, stop killing us, what did they get? They were killed more. And so that statement where a policeman will say to you, I will waste you, nothing will happen. On the 20th of October, 2020, the Nigerian government actually reinforced that statement where they would ask a police or any of the security agents uh, agents can waste you and not, nothing would, would happen. So in terms of that, yes, the toll gate is reopening. Uh, and there are, there are people who have said no justice, no tolling. And they, 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 are, they, are, they are focused on ensuring that does not happen. But one of the things that I think every one of us should take on board and should really make us sit down and think about our lives as, as citizens of this country, whether indeed we're citizens or we're slaves, is the fact that less than 11 months or maybe 10 months to election, to, to a general election, the government is coming out to reopen a toll gate where people were killed, where people were killed by soldiers that were brought in by the Nigerian government. Innocent citizens who said, please don't kill us, were actually being killed. They are, they are reopening this toll gate that has such a painful memory, where justice has not fully been given to the victims, where even the panel that was set up by the state, that indicted the state, and indeed said there was violence meted out on the people. The state hasn't done much about that, about the report from the panel. They haven't even accepted per se. They haven't owned up to what they have done, yet they are coming out to now begin to say they want to reopen it. A few months to election. It say that see, if there's anything that says that there's no regard, absolute zero regard for Nigerian citizens, I think that's the message. And I think what the Nigerian citizens should be thinking about right now is to ensure that we are using the power that we have. Our capacity to vote is the power that we have. We don't have weapons, we don't have guns like the terrorists. We don't have security agents like the government. The only thing that we, the citizens, have are actually our votes. And we must ensure that we are using that vote. Because if they know that they do this, we are going to vote them out. They will not dare us in this way. This is the time that we have the power. You go to the negotiating table when, when you are from the place of strength. This is our pl place of strength as we go to the 2023 uh, uh, election. So beyond the fact that, oh, whether the city, whether the, uh, the protesters and all of that, there are a lot of people who forget that the government meted out, uh, uh, brought violence into the NSAS protest. They brought in talks to uh, attack the NSAS uh, protesters. The NSAS protesters were peaceful. All of the rampage that happened after that was actually due to the fault of the government. The talks that they brought in overpowered them and went on a rampage, and it had nothing to do with the protesters. What we should be looking at now is the fact that the government, this Lagos state government, is putting its hand, its hand, its finger in the eyes of the people. Are we going to sit down and watch them do that to us? First of all, also, I will round up by saying that we must ensure that the people we are putting in the legislative arm of government, which is the bedrock of our democracy, the members of the legislative arm of government, they make laws, they have oversight functions, and they, they have the capacity to hold the executive accountable. If the Lagos state government knew that there was a, a, Lagos, state, a Lagos state house of assembly that will hold them accountable, he wouldn't have been called, called he wouldn't have called in soldiers to come and kill people the way they did at the lake like it toll gate but because then you know that they are not there to hold him accountable and we saw after the killings what happened the Lagos state uh house of assembly had a sitting and what they were doing was practically uh, paying homage to one citizen instead of the citizens that have been killed so this for us i would say it's a slap on our face as citizens they have dared us they've thrown down the gun they've put their fingers in our eyes what are we going to do? Are we going to punish them politically at the polls with the power that we have? Or are we going to sit down and not use our powers and not even go out to vote and allow the terrorists and the terrorist government to continue to kill us in our own nation? All right. Well, thank you, Aisha. Uh, we, we will take a, a break. And when we come back, we we'll look at the solutions you pointed out and see whether they will work or not. So let's take a, a small break and we'll be back.
Oh, I said, oh, Aisha, you have not heard your voice. You've not been... What's there to talk about? Nothing. This government is, is a failure. We have said that several times. This government, it's even failure is ashamed of this government. Even failure is ashamed of Buhari's government. So sitting down and talking about Buhari's government and its failure is absolute nonsense. If that's what I'm still doing, then I will not, I will not be any different from Buhari. I will be as incompetent as he has, he has been and also be a failure. Now is the time for election. Everybody must be a political activist. So you are either running for office because you are capable of giving good governance or you are volunteering and campaigning for people who are competent and running for office or you are helping them to raise money because without money we can't get anything we must put our, our our monies where our votes are people who are running for office we must donate to them and then finally we are holding people voted into office accountable we can no longer sit and, and do nothing a lot of people you've been talking they will tell that oh democracy this politics has failed democracy how would democracy fail how do you even have a pvc you don't have a PVC and you are talking democracy and faith. You are the reason why it's a failure. Have you ever voted? You have a PVC, yet you have not gone out to go and vote. You don't vote. You sit down in one place. You're waiting for prayers to help you. Okay, fine. Fine. Keep praying now. Sit down now. You shouldn't even have opened this video. You should have been praying that you will see what is in this, in this, in this, in this video. You come out to vote, you will not sit down to ensure that your vote is counted and everything. You go home, you say democracy is not working. You are not looking for people who have competence, character and capacity that will enter into office. You will vote for certain parties and say, oh, it's only this party or that party that can win. And so therefore, an election is not by grammar. You vote for people who are failure. You will not vote the right person that will go in there. And yet you say democracy is a problem. You are the problem. We cannot sit down like this and keep watching people being killed anyhow. We have it. The miracle you've been asking for that you've been praying for is here. It comes once every four years. And it is in your hand again. If you like, you don't use it. Another four years of suffering. By that time, people will look back and say, Ah, Buhari's government, ah, it was a good government. It was even better than... Yes. Because the last government we had, we thought we can never have wor worse than that. Another one came, you all watched and they became worse. You do nothing again, you vote anyhow, you will see another worse one. We'll continue on this journey, on this senseless journey. Nigeria is more. Welcome back to 90 Minutes Africa. Uh, we are uh, having a conversation with Aisha, uh, who joined us from uh, Abuja. I think. Are you in Abuja? Actually? Yes, yes, I am. Okay. All right. So, so we we've had um, you proposing things that should be done. One of the things you uh, you always talk about is the ability of people to vote. And and mm -hmm. most of, of uh, Nigerian people, they come back and say to you, to, to people who propose that as a solution. Um, they point at what happened in Imo State, they point at the rigging of elections across Nigeria. We know that elections in Nigeria are not, not that it's perfect anywhere, but but that it's, it's horrible to the point that the people's vote don't end up being the determining factor. So when people come back with you to you with that uh, pushback, what do you say to them? Uh, the first thing I say, I say to them is that they must never focus on the exception. We cannot allow the exception to be the norm. So because of a few uh, uh, bad things that have happened, people will now look for every excuses. By the way, I always say to them, excuses are like shoes, and you always find the one that fits. If you don't want to do something, and you want to have one, one million and one excuses, you will actually find them. So that's what they look for. For, for those who say that votes don't count, I always say to them, if votes don't count, why then do politicians buy votes? Votes don't count is the big lie that is sold in Nigeria, and it's normally sold to the educated and the elite. So when they tell them votes don't count, they stay away from the polling unit. Then it's only those whose votes can be bought who are not very educated. Mind you, democracy without education is a disaster. You, in a democracy, you have somebody who is a professor of political science and somebody who knows nothing about politics, does not realize the relationship between governors and his life, does not know anything about democracy, we cancel his votes. Because it's one man, one vote, one woman, one vote. So when people say, and I said this big lie that I sold to Nigeria and keep the elite 
uh, who are always missing during election, the people who do not understand, who do not understand what their vote actually is, their votes are bought. And then they go, they go to, uh, to, uh, to the polling unit, they are the one who casts the vote, and at the end of the day, it's who they want that, that, that comes out there. So having said that, the next thing, of course, is that most of the people who actually say this, they don't even have their PVC. They've never registered for election, but they will tell you that, oh, it, it will not work. Why don't you, first of all, participate? And then we have people who actually register, but they register, they do not come out to vote. If you register and you do not come out to vote, what you simply do is that your ballot paper, you give it to the person who has the, the, uh, the highest power to rig. Because the, the, the INEC, the electoral body, we send the number of ballot papers of the registered voters. If there are 500 people in a particular polling unit, INEC will send 500, maybe plus a few in, in case of mistakes. And if, if only 50 people come out, there is excess 450. That is the one that some people, whoever, and this happens with whatever party, some of them that are dominant in that area, they will use that and turn preach. So by you not being there, you've allowed, you've given up of your power to, be, uh, to the dominant party there to use it to turn preach. And that's what they have been doing. So in terms of, if we find a situation whereby when people come out to vote and they defend their vote, they sit down there, they, this, this rigging doesn't happen. Rigging normally happens when there's low turnout. When there's high turnout, in places where there are high turnout, they are not able to rig. And there are places where we, we saw the Anabra election, where this lady, some women who said no, even with the money given to them, they said no, we are going to vote our choice. And they did vote that their choice. But beyond that also is to say to a lot of the people who are skeptical about the election that, look, there's a new electoral act. The way of rigging of before it has been mitigated against. The politicians might look for more ways to be able to subvert that electoral act. Therefore, now they have not found out it. Why then don't we come out and use this new electoral act that we have and use it? There's, there is the, uh, the uh, before verification that is done before election. They say you use your face or they use your finger. We saw that was I took part in the Lagos in the Abuja uh, council election, the local government election, and that's what they did. My fingerprint didn't go at the end of the day. They did they did facial recognition. We I we was somebody who went his finger didn't go through his facial recognition didn't go through, and he was unable to vote. And you saw one of the a minister uh, was the minister of Abuja state for state, the lady who come out to say uh, after the Abuja local government election, where she was saying that oh, I probably should look at for ways that uh, they, they can still use those incidental forms so that if you are not verified, and people just boot her down. People want credible election. They want their, even if you're voting, even if they vote the wrong person or who we know what, let it be that it was their choice, not that there's one thing or the other uh, being done. So now we have uh, 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 an electoral act. So that excuse, in a way, it's gone. What we need now is that people must participate in the electoral process. One of the, one of the attributes of good governance, the only way you can get good governance is that there must be participation. People must participate. And if people are not participating, there's no higher going to get that, uh, that good governance. So now we are saying to people, there's a one for five PVC that is going on right now. Register for your PVC or if you're already registered, after you've registered, get five people to register for their PVC. Help those five people get five people also to register for their PVC. Then organize a PVC registration drive in your community, your locality, your estate, your church, the market, whatever it is, organize or where people can easily come. Now we have our online pre-registration that can be done. So it makes it easier. And then people will now go and do their biometrics at, at INEC. So help people to do that. And at the end of the day, we should vote with sense, not voting out of sentiment, not voting because of religion. Region, not voting because somebody is from our region. Katsina State, they have the president. The, the, the president and commander in chief is from Katsina State. Guess which state is the most insecure in Nigeria? Is that Katsina State? People, people can stay even in their villages. It didn't matter that their son is a president. It didn't matter that their son is a commander in chief. What would have mattered would be competence, character, and capacity. If we had a, a, a more competent uh, commander in chief, then their lives would be secured. If we had a commander in chief who, who knew his onions, who knew who knows leadership, who knows how to lead, how to lead from the front, not to be missing in action, their lives would be more secure. Our lives would be more secure. Everybody's lives will be, will be more secure. And so it's not just about uh, voting at, at, out of sentiment. So for those who do not participate in elections, this is what we are saying to them. And every four years, there's a miracle. Like you had that a video. 
biggest problem we've had beyond the fact that a lot of people are not educated and i say to people the education that we have is not for us alone it's for millions of others who have not had the opportunity and the privilege to be educated so we must talk to people how many of us are using our circle of influence there are people we are the ones who are carrying the weight of the faith when government feel we are the ones who, who become stop gap for government we play the role of government in people's lives we are sending people to school we are paying people school fees we are people paying people's health care bills they are sending us tests they are hungry we are sending monies to them and all those of you in diaspora we are those of us in nigeria are always calling you to tell you that we need money things are hard you are sending money to us do you ever ask what what are do we even have PBC? Do you ever ask whether the people are going to vote? This is time for us. We every one of us. We are the structures. We have that uh, uh, circle of influence. We need to begin to ask the people around us what kind of uh, 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 democratic decision are, are you making? What electoral decision are you making? Do you have your PBC? Are you participating or are you also part of the problem that that we we ha we have right now? All of that needs to be done for us to be able to get this uh, the, the right kind of leadership that you're looking for. And as, like I said in that video, we need every one of us, we now have to become uh, political activists. We must ensure political activism, what does it, our protest must be through the ballot paper. What does it entail? One, run for office if you have the competence, character, and capacity. Or campaign for those who are running for office that you know have competence, character, and capacity and will do the right thing. Or uh, help them to raise funds. Nigerians are waiting today that it is the people who have stolen our money that will now come and run for office and then they will, be, they will use their money to run for office. As long as we are waiting on that, as long as we do not put our monies where our votes are, it is the people that have stolen our collective work that will continue to perpetuate themselves in office and also perpetuate their studies uh, in office. And so we must put our monies uh, where our votes are. And finally, we must ensure that anybody that is voted into office whether we know that person or not, whether we are the same religion, whether we are the same region, the same time, whatever, we must hold them accountable and ensure that they give us good governance, accountability and transparency. Where they fail, we must criticize them. Our business is not psychophancy. Our business is not to worship them. Our business is to hold them accountable and ensure that they give Nigeria the right kind of environment where the child of nobody can become somebody without knowing anybody. Yeah. All right. Let me. Uh, sorry, Chido. Let me. Let me follow up because there's one other issue that people bring up when they want to talk about credibility of elections. I'll play a video for you, and then I'll get a reaction to that. All right, those are underage children uh, voting, obviously, uh, especially in Kano, and it's been reported several times. Uh, people point at things like that to say that even before the election is conducted, that it's already rigged. Um, how do you convince people who feel that way, that it's not hopeless, that they should participate and do something, even before the election, to make sure that we have a credible election? Because as long as people feel that we don't have, their votes will not count because of these things, they will not participate. Okay, so um, in the, in the first thing that I say to such people is to first of all say to them, the, the 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 election of the press the electing of the president is not the end of election so if that happens in kano right so let's say kano let's say okay that will affect the outcome of the presidential election for the to for it to affect every other person the all the other people that it will affect will be the the people that are being sent in from that kind of the governor and, and and all of that so if for example in kano they are doing underage voting in Edo State, I'm from Edo State. I was born and brought up in Kano. I'm from Edo State. In Edo State, they refuse to do underage voting, and people actually come out to vote, and they vote in the most competent person as governor, and they vote in the most competent people as a, a, a House of Assembly members. By the way, Edo State right now is having issue with House of Assembly members, though we don't focus as much on Edo, where the governor uh, uh, has, uh, how do I put it, like a, like a dictator, 
has has not allowed some house members to actually see it, have refused to uh, allow them to be sworn in. That's a story for another day. So if, for example, everyone in our own state, we are all bringing in uh, competent people, then they are doing the needful. People from uh, uh, Kano say, whether they like it or not, they will begin to see that, that they are uh, underage voting that they are doing, which is the state that is going to be affected. It's there that will be affected, right? They, they will be they, they will be affected. So for somebody to be in another place to say that, oh, they are not going to vote because they are going to be underage voters, it doesn't make any sense. It does because you are also doing the same thing by staying away from the from the whole process. So why don't we in the other states where they are not underage voting? Because a lot of times people say from the northern part of the country there is this underage uh, 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 voting. Why why don't we the other states where there are no underage voting begin to come out and actually vote? Lagos State has one of the lowest turnouts when it comes to an election. But yet, I, I've never heard of Lagos State being, uh, you know, indicted for underage uh, voting. So what has stopped the people? From coming out, if the people come out and credibly uh, vote for people that will get into office, in terms of the House of Representative members we are sending in, the senators we are sending in, the House of Assembly members, all of that, the governors, and they're doing very well. And then we have a little bit of this short uh, fall from the issue of the president. Then we'll know, okay, other states are doing well. Let's focus on the ones who are not doing well. To let me let them know that look, see what your counterparts are doing. We don't even have any of such things. Uh, uh, in, in Nigeria, it's just people, everything not working well. Like I said earlier, excuses are like shoes, and people will find excuse not to do, not to come out. People will use every sort of excuse that they're looking for. If it's not on the age, it will be one thing or the other. It will say, oh, they are both one card or whatever. But the most important thing, why don't we come out and begin to make uh, the, the choices the credible choices that we need to make. There's another thing that normally happens, which uh, you haven't touched, uh, asked me a question of, but I'm going to touch, touch on right now, is the fact that there are a lot of people who will say to you, they don't want to waste their vote. And so when they say they don't want to waste their vote, they will vote for anybody that they feel their party they can win, rather than the person that is deserving of the vote. That's one big problem that we've had in Nigeria. So a lot of times people look at election and take politics to be like uh, like being a fan. I'm a Man U fan. What, Man U is winning or losing, I'll be a Man U fan. Or I'm a Kano Pillars fan. If they are winning or losing, I'll be a Kano Pillars fan. Or whatever, a new good angels and all of that. Uh, I'm a fan. Okay, I, I, my in my own national I was watch the one I carried when I was much younger. I would be a fan of that, even though it's not there now. But it does different from governance. So you, there's a feeling you feel. There's a feeling of high that you feel when your party, when your your club is winning. It's not the same thing with election because election it affects your life. It affects your earning. It affects every aspect of your of your life so when people sit down and say that oh i don't want to waste my yeah i know this person is credible or they will say to you and you think an election is by grammar when credible people are coming out they are laughed at they are maligned they are shamed from running oh you think politics is by grammar oh you are bringing manifesto it's by the street and at the end of the day we look we look for we are voting in challenges because we don't want to lose election the real loss of the real loss of election is when you don't vote the people who are supposed to be in office who have the competence character capacity because you are afraid that we lose and go and vote people who can't do nothing for you because you think they will win Nigerians must understand that the structures that we are talking about are actually the people. And voting is about one person, they're counting the votes one after the other. One person voting for the credible people, the second person they are voting for them, the third, and that's how they will count uh, uh, those votes. So these are also some things, some things that Nigerians should be lo looking into. What we must always focus on in Nigeria, I always say, and in, even in life and everything, is what has been our, uh, what's our effort, not the results. Most times we don't focus on the effort. We don't focus on what we're supposed to do. What we can do, the effort that we put in is in our control. That's what you can control. So I will go to the polls. In the last election, I was the only person that voted for my candidate in my, in my polling unit. I waited for morning. I was there at around at 9, was it 8, 9? I waited till about 3 a.m. For every total to be counted. And the following day, I was at the collation center to ensure that my one vote was protected and counted. It didn't matter that my candidate did not win. And for me, it was on 
I didn't, if I wasn't voting parties, I was voting candidates. I have different candidates. Uh, they were all different parties for the different uh, offices. And that's one thing also Nigerians must begin to do. Vote candidates, not parties. And so at the end of the day, I knew that I had done, that was what was, uh, that was my own effort. That was in my own control. That was what I, would con I could control. The result was never something I could control. I couldn't control that my candidate will win. Another candidate won, right? Uh, a different candidate won at my polling unit. Uh, a different candidate won in Abuja, a different candidate won at the at the end of the day. So be it. But I know I've done my part. But the problem we have is that a lot of people are not even putting the effort. They are not put, doing their bit, but they are fo focusing on the result that is not even in their uh, in, in, in their power to focus on. Let's focus on the effort first. Okay, Chido. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think you've uh, laid down the gauntlet. There are a number of uh, issues we can take out of your uh, presentation in the last few uh, minutes. But let me start, and I would ask a number of questions. Then maybe if you give us uh, short responses, it will be helpful so that we can also get uh, the audience to participate. And a lot of the questions, the, uh, some of the questions I'll be asking is a reflection of uh, the comments from the chat box from the audience. One is that, why are you are, are you interested in running for office? Uh, and then uh, we can talk about the issue of vote. We know the reality in Nigeria today is that we have two dominant political parties. We don't have independent candidates yet. So a lot of the candidates would naturally emerge from these two parties. Uh, how do how does that then uh, solve some of the issues you've raised in terms of who to vote uh, who to vote for? Then uh, finally, we have more women, I suppose, than men in Nigeria. Women have one of the issues we are hoping we used in advertising the program today was the prospects of a female president in Nigeria. Uh, it, has it crossed your mind, for example, to say if women, majority of Nigerian are women, if they decide to form a political party and vote fellow women, that will have, will not just ensure that we have more women in position of power, which I think will change a lot of things, it will address some of the concerns we have. And finally, perhaps the issue of uh, what happened the disgraceful com uh, conduct of uh, the Senate when they passed, uh, when they stopped the various bills that are supposed to go into the Constitution in terms of uh, gender inclusion or the expansion of the democratic uh, uh, spirit. We'd like to get your thoughts on some of these issues. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I've written them down. So if I, in case after answering, I miss anything, just just let me know. Uh, the first of the first one is, are you interested in running? No, I'm not interested in running. Uh, that question probably asked me in 2031. I might be able to give an answer. Uh, I I love the demand side of governance. Uh, I am not. I've never worked for anyone before. I don't like being in offices. I don't like being accountable to anyone. Uh, I'm the kind of person that would decide. I I wake up in the morning. I go and travel three months before coming back to Nigeria as a public servant. I will not be able to do that. And I I also am very mindful of the fact that I've never uh, been in a position of uh, 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 leadership. Uh, so my competence and my capacity and some of the things that I'm working on, I'm doing a lot of uh, courses and all of that in terms of self-development. And so in 2031, I'll be able to answer that question to know whether I want to run uh, because I don't want to run or whether it's because I don't uh, have the capacity. A lot of people have said I should run for president. Even if I run for president, I will not vote for myself because I don't have enough capacity. It's not to be there just to for siding to be blown at you or because you're popular. It's to be there to change people's lives so that in 50 years or 100 years, years, people will be able to say that, wow, you were a president of this country or a senator in this country or something, and you did the right thing. So that's one. On the issue of two dominant political parties, uh, what we can do about that is to vote candidates instead of parties. I think I did mention that earlier. We must stop this issue of saying that, oh, it's only parties that can win. Everyone, every everybody, we are, we are in a place in Nigeria where we need people with capacity and competence. If we keep saying that, 
only two dominant parties, only these parties can win, and they are the only ones we are voting for. What will happen is that they will keep doing what they are doing right now, which is to continue to give us candidates that are not competent. These parties, they have very competent candidates that have character and capacity, but they will never give them the tickets. They want the people who, who they can control. So the only way we can force them to do that is for us to vote in, to not vote party, but for vote candidates and look for where these candidates are. When these parties begin to see that Nigerians are voting uh, candidates instead of parties, they too they will change and will be forced to uh, to bring in uh, competent uh, uh, candidates. Let's also remember that we are the structures. The people are the structures. The parties don't have any structures. It is the people that are structures, and you can volunteer to 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 be in the campaign of anybody that you feel has competence that is running uh, for 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 office. I, I will I will jump to the last question before I come to this other one on the issue of the National Assembly and the gender bills. I think what the National Assembly did was to show its disdain for women. This is not the first time. Every time that any gender bill, the uh, gender equality bill has been thrown out several times right from the Eighth Assembly. They've always shown that they do not have any respect for women. They have disdain for women. There's a senator, Senator Yusuf, uh, who once on the floor of the Senate stood up to say that women are not equal to men. The last time the gender uh, equality bill came up before the Senate, he said women are not equal to men. But yet, during election, these people, do. He, he will not count the, the female voters as, as half of his uh, of, of the votes that he's getting. But on the floor, when it comes to giving governance, when it comes to participation in election, they count women are equal. They want women there. But when it comes to governance, they not tell us that we are not as equal uh, as they are. Back to the issue of more, I think that's the last of the questions, series of questions you, you gave me now. Back to the issue of more women. You know, a lot of people always say that there are more women in Nigeria. In Nigeria, women should be able to come together, vote for themselves. I mean, we're not really looking at the issues. This thing is about power base. And I will tell you, I've never heard of a man who, who, who was threatened, whose spouse threatened him that if he votes, you will be divorced. But I can tell you of a lot of women whose spouses have, have threatened them that if they vote a, a different candidate or the one they don't want, that they will be divorced. Some of them have actually even been divorced. So there are a lot of women who don't have, uh, who are not educated, who are controlled. You, so you can have population. It, it's, it's like somebody coming to say that, oh, Nigeria's population is uh, uh, almost 200 million. Why, why is it that Denmark or Norway, whose population are less than 10 million, they are, they are doing better than Nigeria? You can if you have population, there's no education to go with it. There's no, uh, they, they are not educated. They are held down. Women are told that they have to be controlled uh, by by men. They are either controlled by their husbands or their brothers or their fathers or all of that. There are even some where the women are not even allowed to come out and vote. There are places where they just said, no, you will not go. You, you don't have permission to go out and vote. And so we cannot come and start saying that, oh, women are more. A lot of women women are discriminated against even before they are born, they are born into, into Nigeria. There are women that have been killed just because they were pregnant with girls. There are women that have been abandoned in hospital because they had uh, the girl child. A lot of girls have been denied education simply because they were girls. A lot of girls are married. Or they don't even have right. They are not even allowed to work. Even in our modern society, people who are similarly educated, you find that a woman wants to buy a car. Somebody is saying to her that she shouldn't buy a car. If she buys a car, no man is going to marry her. How many people do not want to approach her? So there are so many things that are affecting her. It's not just about the number. It's not just about being there. The issue of education, the issue of power, the issue of economic empowerment and the whole of that have made women's vote to be controlled by men. And so there are a lot of men who have their own vote and are also controlling the, the votes of other women. Yeah. All right. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me ask you, um, looking at um, the situation in northern Nigeria, um, there was something you said in an interview that I read where you said that we were 11. You didn't have a lot of female friends because most of them were married. And, mm -hmm. and, and either they married or they, they died during childbirth. And, and that uh, by the mm -hmm. time you were 24, when you got married, most of those women were almost grand, grandmothers. Now, has the situation changed in northern Nigeria in the last in the last twenty years, or is it worse than than the period we were talking about? That's one. Yeah. So, so not not that they were almost grandmothers; they were actually grandmothers. Some of my mates were they already had grand uh, children by the time I was getting married at the age of twenty-four. I was actually mocked, and uh, I grew up in Kwanahudu in a place uh, uh, called, uh, called Kwanahudu in Kano. I like to refer to it as the Ajegule of, of, of Kano. It's a place where 
girls got married early they were the ones most of the girls that you see them hawking uh in Kano, they are usually from from that my my area and even the boys as of that time over 70 percent were on drugs and stuff like that, even up to today i saw someone who was talking to me when we we're talking about the nsas protest and where food lumps had been taken to attack people on the 20th of october 2020 in Kano, and he said most of those hoodlums were brought in uh from that corner corner so the, uh, for where i grew up in the situation is almost the same uh, a few a few years ago myself and my brother we were trying to count you know, the number of graduates that were from the place, the, like the huge the community where I grew up in. And we couldn't even get up to 15. And mind you, out of this 15, my father had seven graduates. And they were part of the 15 that were being counted. And so a lot of people who were in school were maligned, were insulted, were called all sorts of names and, and stuff like that. Sadly, the age has increased. It's no longer as young as it used to be uh, during my time, but it's still very young. So during, I, I remember uh, there was a particular, I was in secondary school, I think GS3, and I look back now and I feel I feel pain. I don't I don't actually feel shame because I, I was also a child and I didn't know what was happening, what was happening. One of the girls that we had, you know, then growing up when any of your colleagues are, she was way younger than I, I was then at that time. They are going, they are taking them to uh off to marriage. We we normally escort them to their husband's housing. And there was this particular day, I think she was about eight years old. I knew even at that time, even during my own time when we were young, people were actually surprised, people were talking. It was one she was the daughter of one mile and she was also my namesake and she was taking off for, uh, to my for marriage i think she was either eight or nine or seven i can't remember and and uh, and, and that happened and i was part of those that i was also in secondary school i think i was like maybe 13 13 ish or something else or something like that but what we have right now is that they are getting more older maybe getting to uh some of them are getting to 18 some of them 15 16 17 20 they are with some 20 something they are not getting but the fact is that even though they are not getting married as early as they used to do in my time which is like 24 uh, looks like maybe 30 years ago as of that time but they are not educated yet a lot of people are not educated. A lot of people are not allowed that economic uh, empowerment. You find that, that women, even when it comes to women, are, uh, a woman that is doing very well in business, maybe they are divorced or something, they are selling market, they have a very thriving business. The moment they get married, their husbands ask them to stop the businesses. So you find more of, and which is some of the things that have been saying in a lot of videos I've been doing to the Northern Nigeria to say that, I do not understand where you say women should be kept inside the house because you don't want men to see them. But you send little children in their teenage years, children 15, 16, 17, 18, 13, 14, they are the ones who are hawking. Meanwhile, mothers in their 40s, 50s, 30s are inside the house hidden away. Even if that woman, at, I'm 48 years old, even if I go out stuck naked, nobody will look at me. The world, what is this? What's in your body to be admired? But my 20-year-old, my 17-year-old, my 16-year-old, a female that goes, uh, that's a different ball game. But you find out that they are the ones that are being sent out. And most of them, they are being raped. They have a lot of uh, sexual violence against them. They end up not going to school. They have no education. They don't even learn anything about the house, how to take care of the house, whether wash, do any, no household chores because they are always selling things. And at the end of the day, some of them get married, they get divorced, they have children, their husband sends them away, they get married again, they have children. They are, the other husband that wants to marry them is not ready to take in those children and the children are thrown on the street. They are all over the place. They treat children, they are marjory, and the circle continues again and again and again. And let me tell you something also. When I was uh, the first, uh, when I was uh, a teenager, there are actually uh, boys, fellow teenagers, and young adults that will come to you and say, please, can you borrow them money? That the next riot they are going to pay you. I'm talking about early 90s, 1991, 1992, 1993, 1994 kind of situation whereby people were borrowing money against the next riot. And so even that was where even when Nigerians we say that, oh, you know, suicide bombing can never come to Nigeria, terrorism can never. I used to say to them, you've not lived in certain parts of the northern part of Nigeria to see where life actually means nothing. These children, at the age of three, they are sent on the streets. They do, some of them do three years without showering. There's something they call Kanzo in house. You see greenish thing on their skin. A three-year-old child will start fending for themselves. Nobody cares about them. When they come close to people, people drive them away. People look at them with such anger and disdain. The only thing that they are seen as important is when during riots, they carry a weapon. That's when people look at them with fear and respect. And so when Boko Haram came, 
a lot of them were ready to move in and go there. I was in Kaduna in 2018, where there were massive movement of youth from all over the northern part of the country going down to, to Borno to go and join uh, Boko Haram. The northern part of the country did nothing about it, and they still aren't addressing the main issue. We still have a lot of people who are on the street. Those children who are on the streets today, they have access to uh, access to technology, access to social media. They can see a lot of things on YouTube. They can be indoctrinated even where they are. And so what are we even talking about the future of Nigeria? There's a whole lot of problem that we have. Thank you very much. Certainly, there is a whole lot of problem. Uh, quickly, we'd like to get the audience in, and we have uh, about 20 minutes uh, to go. Maybe in the next five minutes, we'll play a video about uh, Governor Yaya Bello declaring for president and get your take on some of the people who have declared for president so far, who, unless something happens, may end up being our president in 2023. And then uh, we'll get the audience to... The All Progressives Congress, APC. The Secretary to the Government of Kogi State, Dr. Mrs. Ayawade Folashade Arika, my Chief of Staff, Pharmacist Muhammad Jamiu Azuku, all the Honorable Commissioners here present, all political and top government officials. All of our revered traditional rulers from Kogi and all other states here present, members of the diplomatic corps. All right, we have to stop here. Uh, Chido, what's the question? Uh, yeah, so uh, it, it's, uh, it's amusing. I mean, personally, uh, I don't know whether I should bring myself into this, but it's, it's tragic. That just tells you if you were to ask for my personal opinion how low Nigeria has sunk, if uh, these are the characters that uh, are front runners for the election. But let me, you are our guest. I would like to get your take quickly before we go to the audience. Uh, some of uh, the candidates or aspirants who are making the rounds in the last few weeks. I think uh, you 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 said it all by saying that uh, it's really tragic. It's really tragic. It's it's an insult on our sensibilities. It just uh, uh, and I don't blame them. I don't blame them. When we keep when we, when we we have sort of like shamed the good people out of politics, and you also see we are also shaming good people out of um, uh, uh, what is it now out of appointments. So when people they are shamed, oh, what are you doing there? Oh, it's only. Uh, you you, are, you only speak grammar. Politics is you think politics is by grammar, politics, and that's why we got uh, to where we are today. That uh, Yahaya Bellu, who who has uh, not done anything for Kogi State, if uh, that you could see without the violence that was meted out during that Kogi State election, he probably wouldn't have been governor because what he had, he was so woeful that the people were actually ready to vote vote him out. You saw the the violence that was brought in into the Kogi State election for him to still be uh, 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 brought back. Uh, uh, as the uh, as the uh, the uh, Kogi State uh, governor, but one of the things that you say, I will tell you, uh, uh, Chido, that the fact is that Nigeria has gone so low. Nigeria is so low that it needs the a ladder to climb the belly of the snake. That's how low we have gotten. Everything is more than six foot down. There's nothing, you know. Uh, it, it, it's unbelievable. But I think uh, as long as the Nigerian elite continue to behave that it is not their problem that. If they are, they are, they are, they are, as long as their family are okay with their families and we look the other way, more and more of this will continue to happen. As long as Nigerians in diaspora continue to send money to us when we are asking them, without them telling us that we need to also begin to vote in uh, competent people, nothing is going, uh, not th th this kind of thing will continue to happen. And one of the things I'll quickly round up by saying that we need to do tough love in Nigeria. There must be tough love. I started in 2019. My New Year resolution was that I will no longer be stopgap for people that refuse to hold their government accountable. If you are not holding your government accountable, then you should be able to experience the the bad governance that comes from it. We must begin to ask people if you are not voting right. We are not going to take their problems because as long as we continue to carry their problem, they see us as the ones that are supposed to carry their problem and not the people that have voted into office. And that needs to change. All right. So if you want to join us, uh, please. Uh, you, you, the link is up there. Uh, when you turn on, when you come into the studio, turn on your camera so that we can let you in. Actually, let me let me just ask you, uh, in kind of uh, in a 
in a uh, humorous way. I, I, I know that in 1991, you, you applied to join the Nigerian Defense Academy. You wanted to be in the military. Had it been you were accepted, um, what, what would you be doing now you know, in the military looking at Nigeria today and the security, insecurity problems? Uh, so I didn't apply. I wanted to apply. So when they said uh, I couldn't go in because I was female, so of course there was nothing. Uh, there was no application uh, 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 to be done. And my and my and my goal then I don't know whether it was this childish goal. I wanted to be a field marshal. So that was for me. Ultra second, I was like, no, I'm going. I'm going to be the first female uh, field marshal in Nigeria. But I will tell you one thing. If I if I had gotten into the army, I probably might not still be there right now. Uh, because uh, they they would really sack me just like what they did to is it General Deni. Who had, who had come out to speak against what was happening and the next thing they demoted him, they definitely would have either demoted me or sacked me or do something because I would not watch all of these things going on and, and, and be quiet. And even not just in, in politics, that's one of the things I always say, even partisan politics. I'm not, like people say, oh, why don't you join a particular party? I'm like, me, they will drive me for anti-party activities or whatever I think they, they do. Because if you're not doing the right thing, I'm going to call you out. And even if in the military are not doing, if they are not doing the right thing, I would have, I would have called them out. But most important thing is to say that it should have been about serving the constitution and serving Nigeria and not serving the president and whoever is the ruling party. Because that's what we have right now. A lot of people are afraid. They would rather serve the president rather than serving uh, the constitution. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we have uh, a few people joined us already, and uh, I, will, I will tell everybody who we are um, to um, make the question very short 30 seconds minimum, and maximum one minute. We can't take more than one minute. We have very few 15 minutes left. So let me come to you, um, uh, Ovie. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, good afternoon, uh, Sister Aisha. We welcome to come from my state to Up Edo. <laughs> hey, we do that. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, um, kind of, I follow you from, you know, the beginning of the section. I'm kind of this is the Bro, Grant, you don't have this cell phone, though. May you quit okay. use that, but it's not something that you can I will not take him out. <laughs> that's of a, that space of a bring back our girls. Do you think you guys could have done a lot better if you guys turned that movement to a political union and go down to grassroots, even more secondary school to educate more you know, public about how the system actually works? Because I believe that every Nigeria don't understand the kind of politics we play. And you kind of, uh, you know, draw conclusion to the fact that we need to participate, we need to get involved, we need to vote. So turning that movement, turning that movement to a political union, you think you have done a better job than how far you guys have come? All right, thank you. Thank you, OK. Uh, let's go to uh, Uche. Uh, I think I, I put in Uche. OK, no, I didn't. Oh, Uche, yeah, you're there. Uche, go ahead. 30 seconds. Please. OK, Uche is gone. Um, uh, Pius, are you okay? Go ahead, Tari. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I have a question for Isaac. Uh, please, uh, my sister, you have been doing so well, and uh, I appreciate. Why is it that uh, people are kind of uh, hiding away from saying the truth, knowing fully well that the henchmen, this uh, henchmen were brought by Buhari and the Aero Five to Nobu before the, the election 2000 and. Uh, 15 against a Jonathan good luck. Why? All right. Because every time we keep asking you why they not uh, full of knees and this and that, but we look at all right how they came into the country. Okay, thank you. Thank uh, you. Pais. Yeah, Pius, thank you so much. Let's go to uh, Omolu, Omolu, uh, um, Omolu, Abi. Omol, Omolu, Abi. <laughs> Omolu, Abi. Uh, how are you? Okay, how are you? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please, uh, you're welcome. Okay, your question. Right. Um, basically, what I want to ask is, um, right, do you think, um, I mean, looking at what uh, the candidates that has been produced, you know, that we're seeing people wanting to um, um, run for office and all that stuff, and the situation of the country and all that, do you really think, um, you know, Nigeria can still work? Because you have um, other people, other uh, different tribes like the uh, Yoruba nation, 
wanting to, you know, depart, from, exit from Nigeria. And, um, you know, and the, the situation of the country is, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know, because the people are not, the people that are running the government are not paying attention. Mm. Okay, because, thank you. Thank you. We have... Because, sorry. Okay, good. So, yeah, sorry, have, I can hear you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, we can hear you. Thank you so much. We have to let it go um, for now. I, I'm actually just 30 seconds to one minute. Then she will answer to, to everybody. Yeah, go ahead. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity given to me. Uh, my question is, is a very direct one. Um, in the light of all that we've seen, what has been going on in the country from the NSAS protest and uh, the way it has you know, evolved and all that happened after. Um, Madam, would you say, what do you see after the 2023 election? Are you seeing a major kind of change happening in Nigeria? Or are we likely going to still fall into the hands of probably the PDP or APC, uh, where we are seeing, you know, what they are bringing, and <laughs> there, is, there is no sign they are sensitive to what the people of Nigeria are feeling at this time? Are you seeing a kind of political revolution happening through through the ballot box um, after 2023, or are we likely going to continue in all of um, these uh, struggles and narratives and? Uh, you know, desolation that is, you know, living the land for right. a very long All right. time. All right, Amechi, thank you so much. Um, okay, Aisha. Uh, okay, thank you so much. So I'll start with uh, OV, uh that said uh, uh, whether turning BBOG into a political uh, movement. Uh, we cannot turn BBOG into a political movement because BBOG, it uh, came out, all, out of a tragedy. Is a tragedy of uh, people who were taken away, and it would be most insensitive and almost heinous for us to ever think that we will not turn that, uh, we will make it political. One, and it's always very uh, comical to so those of us who were actually at the, uh, members of the Bring Back Our Girls movement when people try to say that, oh, in 2015, that was what we used to remove the government, it was turned into it was never. I remember Dr. Obez did everything at the Unity Fountain. Nobody was even allowed to talk about politics when we were having a city. We always say when you get out of there, uh, you do it. So it's it's not something that that, that that ever crossed our minds, and it's not something that we would ever do because this is about the tragedy of people. You, can, you cannot use people's pain to do this thing. But there are other things that have uh, come out. Our uh, members of Bring Back Our Girls or other have moved on to do different things. Like when we did the Red Card uh, movement, there's also for Citizens Alliance that we're co currently on with other active Nigerian citizens, which is trying to educate people on uh, on their politics, democracy, letting people know the relationship between governance and their lives. And it's also something that everyone must take on. This is something that every one of us must be doing beyond political movement. We have people that we influence. Let's talk to our family members our friends, our relations, the people we do business with on a daily basis, uh, and, and, and a whole lot of that, and we get that education uh, on. Uh, Uche said something about why do people turn away from the truth uh, that Buhari brought, Buhari, Erufai, and co brought in the terrorists. I think uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would put my life on the line and say that's actually a lie. And that's the thing that we do in Nigeria over and over again. And we sort of us to focus on issues. We actually go about all of these conspiracy theories. And the people who actually give us bad governance continue to uh, to use that to their advantage. One of the things I, I would say is this. Uh, uh, for example, when Jonathan was in office, a lot of people said that uh, uh, the, 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 the terrorists go for Haram, that they were actually snipers that were brought in by Jonathan. Many people said that, uh, oh, you know, they were this this was payback time for Biafra, that the southern part of the country. I remember some people, you know, coming to me because a lot of people do whether they forget or they don't remember that I'm actually from the southern part of Nigeria, even though I was born and brought up uh, in the northern part of the country. And in uh, those days, we have Muslims, even though we are minority uh, in my own, in the part that I come from in, in uh, those states. And so they were like, oh, you know, this Boko Haram is actually payback for what had happened in Biafra. That's what the Jonathan government and all of And I would say to them, no, I even have some tweets that I did, you know, say no. The, that Jonathan is not reacting to this, it's not a punishment and a payback, but that it's about incompetence. And that even if it was in the South South that this 
a terrorist attack was happening, Jonathan would not have been able to do anything because he didn't have it in him to do it, just like what we have today with Buhari and the northern part of the country, especially his state being attacked. So all of this issue of where we are bringing all of these conspiracy theories to say that, oh, this or that, that, that's not going to lead us anywhere. And we are not addressing the main issue. The main issue is that we have a lot of people who are angry at the nation. A lot of people who either injustice have been meted on them, whom are the, the, the governors haven't been at their side, and they've had opportunity by raising arms. This is actually like armed protests that these people have been killing people. And that's why you have people that when people sit down to listen to them, they have their own grievances that they got, which is actually nonsense. Because everyone, of course, we all have grievances, but we are not taking arms against the country and we are not we are not taking arms against our fellow citizens and, and killing people. So a lot of uh, a lot of people like the uh, like the Boko Haram started way, way back, I think uh, as far back as, I can't remember now, very early, 1990 something, when this person was killed, the Sheikh uh, Jafar Adams, the teacher of Mohammed Yusuf, the founder of Boko Haram, he was killed in the mosque. And this was as far as the Boko Haram were already on. I think that time was even during the time of Omar Sanjo, before even Yara came. They had started. People were worried, saying, what are these, what these people are doing? But we focus on all of these conspiracy theories, and we don't tackle the main issues. It's like what we are having now in the uh, southeastern part of the country. Instead of us tackling the issues as, as they are, in years from now, people will keep on doing all sorts of uh, conspiracy theories. I think for me, personally, I don't think uh, that, is, uh, that is factual, but then I will always uh, wait to see if there are evidence or anything that puts to that. This is not a, about whether somebody has brought in those things. These are people that, uh, you know, sometimes people will say that, oh, okay, Boko Haram were brought in by people. No, this has been years. I told you as a teenager, there were people who were saying that they would borrow money against the next riot. For some of them, they have no source of living and doing this kind of thing is the way they get their power and their everything from. So killing and maiming has become uh, something uh, uh, that they do uh, a whole lot of time. And even when they started, they were actually killing Muslims. It was Muslims who participated in governance or anything that they were killing before they went haywire uh, the, the, way, the way they did. The other thing also, they said, uh, do I think... Um, Nigeria can work absolutely. Nigeria is such an amazing country. We, we are gifted, we have a lot. If we get good governance, just give us the first 10 years, we will see what will happen in Nigeria. Because we have, a, we have a youth population. We have a lot of people who are, the youth of Nigeria, they're intelligent, they have creativity, they have social media, they have technology, they can crowdsource, crowdsource they have a lot of things. If I don't see the technological world, how well they're doing, even though the government keeps pursuing them and doing all sorts of things. So I see in Nigeria that work. On the issue of uh, different people that want to be on their own, whether it's Biafra, whether it's a uh, Yoruba nation, whether it's South South, it's Middle Bet, and all of that, what I say to people is this. You want a referendum. Right now, our constitution does not allow a referendum, right? Can we have the Yoruba nation participate in the election and send in from that place, send in members to the National Assembly that are going to talk about Yoruba nation? that the agenda would be, let's have a constitution where we can have referendum. If we need to separate Nigeria into uh, different states, let, let's, let's do it. If we need to have devolution of power, let's do it. Can we have those from Biafra? If IPOP say they want a different fine and good, why don't you participate in election? Why don't you be part of those that will bring in credible, competent candidates, have governors, five governors, uh, the Yoruba land, we have six governors, have uh, 15 senators, uh, the other ones we have, is it uh, how many senators now? Uh, I can't remember that. Is it 18 or thereabout? Have those senators, have members of state, uh, state members of assembly, and they use that political might to be able to, ask, to fight for devolution of power. The legislative arm of government can give us devolution of power, can give us a new constitution, can put referendum in the constitution, even without the president. All you need is to tell. They can over, uh, 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 what was the, what was the word they, they call it now? If the president does not uh, assent to it, right. uh, Override the president. I'm not what they use. It's just gone off my 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 head. And then veto, they'll be able to, veto veto yeah, the president. Yeah, they'll use their veto power, and then they'll be able to override the president, and they will put a devolution of power in, 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 into our constitution, and then immediately we will have it. Where we will not have loose ends. Every nation will take care. Even if we have like a loose federation, like what they have in the UK, where there's devolution of power. Scotland has its own uh, sort of like its own government. Wales has its own government. Uh, uh, England, uh, which is the UK 
has its own government. And then, of course, uh, what do you have is the Northern Ireland that from time to time they are still having problems. Sometimes they shut down their, their own uh, assembly. But we, we, we can have loose uh, federation like that and work towards that. But you cannot stay away and say you will not participate in election. Say you cannot, you just be talking and say we should have a referendum. How? The people who are in office now do not, it's not in their interest to give you a referendum. So if you want a referendum, let's start 2023 election is an opportunity. Bring in all your candidates that you know they are going to go there and pursue this referendum issue, pursue the evolution, uh, the evolution of power issue, resource control issue, whatever it is. Let's have them uh, uh, at that particular at that particular place. Whether and one of the things I've always said is that no region, no one region in Nigeria can give you the presidency. Never. You need other regions. So if, for example, you get to the uh, National Assembly, the, the, those from the Odudua uh, region, the, the, the Yorubawa, Yoruba nation, the Biafras, uh, they will come with the Southwest. Those that want Biafra, they, they'll come from the Southeast. Those that want South-South resource control and, and devolution or whatever, they come from the South-South. We have the Middle Belt, the North Central, are uh, coming together, probably the Northeast. You will be able to get whatever referendum you're looking for. You'll be able to get that new constitution you're looking for. You'll be able to get that devolution of power. But we cannot stay and say that we will not participate in election. We will not do anything. And yet you want the power. How? How is that going to happen? Except you're going to take arms against against the state, which is which is which is unlawful, which is going to make you the same way that, that uh, these terrorists are. Then the final question from Amechi, what you say, what do I see after 2023 election? Do I see a political revolution in 2023 election? Honestly, 2023 election, it's unpredictable. It's in the it's even if everybody's even the even the politicians are afraid. Not before that you can say, oh, this person will win. No, anything can happen. Twenty twenty three election depending on the citizens. If the citizens decide to be passive and do nothing and continue to pray to God, what will happen is that we will have the same players who come into election. The 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 uh, what do you call it now? The insecurity will continue. Nothing is going to change. The inflation, the bad of uh, the bad economy, everything will just go downhill. And then four years from now or five years from now, we'll be saying that ah, 2023 was much better than what 2027 and all of that. We'll be you know we like to romanticize the past. Why doing nothing about the future? So that's what we have to. Or Nigerians can decide to be active citizens and say enough is enough and take their, why they are still praying to God. Nobody says you shouldn't pray to God. I'm not saying people should not pray to God. Keep praying to God, but while they are praying, they are also working to ensure good governance, accountability, and transparency in their country, to ensure they determine the people who go into office. And then we will have a total change from what we have, uh, what we have right now. And I will tell you something. The Nigerian youth and Nigerians in diaspora are the game changer. If the Nigerian you decide that they are going to have a consent and agree on a consensus candidate to an essence and say these are the people they are voting for, irrespective of their uh, parties, these are candidates they are voting for, then the Nigerians in diaspora, they have the money. Your one your one dollar is about five hundred or something. Yeah, your one pound is like uh, is it seven hundred or something? It's a whole lot. They donate that money to ensure that you know the the the, the, the issue of the uh, structure the youth bring that in the issue of money diaspora and, and then also the 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 middle class though the nigeria elite we are donating our money to put in this we can have a totally different nigeria that will be amazed at so it is open to anything it depends on the, the part that the citizens decide to play and one of the things i always try to, to tell nigerians is that anytime they think that nigeria will never work they should always look at our telecommunication uh sector once upon a time in nigeria they told us that poor people cannot own mobile phone and sadly we believe them we believe that when they will tell us that people in ghana cobblers market to me were holding phones we would think it was a, a stories from the moons they were telling but it took government policy for nigeria to actually own phone and so when they tell you that nigeria will not work you should not believe them we should but we must put in the work for us to get the nigeria that we dream of uh jim uh it's not jim ron now uh what's his name again harry ford said something he said if you think you can't you can't if you think you can't, you can't. Either way, you're right. So it is left for us to Niger for as Nigerians to, th to, to think whether we can have a great nation or not have a great nation. Whichever one we think it is, we will be right. Because at the end of the day, what the mind cannot conceive, it cannot get it. But I tell you, Nigeria is an amazing country that if we put our all in, we'll get a country that every one of us will be proud of. And there'll be a lot of people that will be fighting to become citizens of Nigeria.
Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aisha. Uh, we're out of uh, 90 minutes. I, I wish we can go for that. I mean, next time, you know, when we book someone like Aisha, we'll have to expand this. So. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful. And we thank all our um, uh, people who were sending their comments. It's endless. And uh, people who joined us in this studio. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for having us. Uh, the conversation continues, and we hope you oblige us the next time uh, we call you. Please follow us on uh, social media, all social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, and uh, YouTube on 90 Minutes Africa. And we hope, ma'am, that you help us uh, send uh, tweets out from your millions of uh, follow us on, on Twitter about this program and about uh, we'll be sharing some of the videos uh, cut out from this event. Thank you so much and uh, see you all uh, next week at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me. Definitely I'll be doing that inshallah. Although I'm currently on social media break until after Ramadan. Uh, but of course if you are, if invite me here, definitely I'll be here. Remember we are all the Afrans. We are here. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, you know when you come to Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, once again, Ramadan Karim. Thank you. Well, yes. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.